Welcome to the eighth annual African Development Conference at Harvard University. To our out of town guests and those that travel from out of the country, I trust that you are enjoying our lovely and according to our own definition here at Cambridge, warm, almost spring, almost summer-like weather. I know it doesn't look like it, but trust me, behind the gray clouds, crisp temperature, and all that white stuff that's floating around the air is great weather, I promise you. And like the theme of the conference, we here at Harvard have perfected the art of imagining what great weather is. I am delighted to spend the next hour exploring how we can imagine new frontiers for collaboration in the African context. I am extremely and tremendously honored to introduce to you our forum speaker and our keynote for the conference. I would like to tell you a personal story. I first met Mrs. Alakija several years ago for a story for Forbes. It was truly love at first sight for us. What was supposed to be an hour-long interview ended up as a lunch, shopping, and dinner excursion in New York City, just her and her girls. As our relationship has blossomed over the years, I recall one year in particular during the Christmas and New Year holidays. I was speaking to Mrs. Alakija over the phone, as has become our habit. She was in London with the rest of the family, waiting for the arrival of her first grandson. As her norm, she had been fasting and praying for a safe delivery and for a healthy baby. As we talked, she went on to say to me, they would be leaving for Lagos the following week. However, she felt that God was telling her to get on a liquid fast and an extended time of prayer for the new year. She was sensing that God wanted her to come up higher. Those were her exact words. Hmm. I said as I reflected on her words, liquid fast extended time of prayer, come up higher. Gosh, I thought to myself, Mrs. Alakija is worth almost $7 billion. How much higher does God want her to come up? And as a normal person in my position would do, I quickly calculated my net worth. I panicked, oh my goodness, I would have to starve as I thought of my own net worth. Sensing my silence, Mrs. Alakija clarified, how can I be more forgiving? How can I be more loving to others? How can I be kinder? How can I be a better Christian? How can you for I be a better Christian? How can we make our families, our communities, Africa, and the world better? How much higher can we come up with our walk with Christ? In that moment, Mrs. Alakija became Mom Alakija to me. That was my own personal, when the student is ready, the teacher will surely appear. Mom Alakija epitomizes the hope of Africa, the promise of Africa. Unconflicted by her role as wife of over 40 years, mother of four sons, grandmother, philanthropist, minister of the gospel, businesswoman, Forbes billionaire, and one of Forbes' 100 most powerful women in the world, Mama Lakija embodies one of my favorite quotes, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. And each opportunity she has seized, as you've seen in the video, whether fashion, digital imaging, real estate, philanthropy, oil. When she has faced fierce and unrelenting resistance, she has remained steadfast, unyielding, determined, and always graceful. I've been privileged to observe her from up close, as any daughter would observe her mother, from spending Tuesdays at her ministry headquarters when I'm in Lagos, Nigeria. Together along with her staff, we serve orphans and widows. I've learned from her how to serve the least of these in Africa. She has funded students' education, myself included, because she believes that we, Africa's youth, are the ones we have been waiting for. And today, we are the ones that have been waiting for her. Please help me welcome Ms. Alakija, Mama Alakija, to Harvard University. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Also, 
Henry Ford once said, coming together is a beginning. Keeping together is progress. Working together is success. In other words, if we want to see the Africa of our dreams, I mean the Africa that you and I long to see, long to pass on and to bequeath to our children and our generations to come. We certainly need to pitch in and do our part. This laudable transformation quest can certainly not be undertaken by a few African nations acting independently and acting on a weak organized partnership. Every jurisdiction needs to be consumed with a passion for a better tomorrow. Contributing resources, especially in areas where there is glaring comparative advantage, and participating in active dialogues, such as what is happening today during this 2017 conference and tomorrow. I feel highly honored to have been invited to be the opening keynote speaker for the African Development Conference 2017. I'm particularly delighted that the focus of these discourses move away from merely highlighting the challenges of Africa. I sincerely look forward to an epoch-making weekend of many ideas and many solutions, leapfrogging Africa and bringing about a truly meaningful African development for her citizens in particular and mankind in general. However, I will be speaking this evening on what I have titled Africa, the renaissance of a new continent via collaboration efforts of member states. I shall review where we are coming from and where we are now post-independence. I will also suggest how best to collaborate to move our continent forward and conclude by highlighting the efforts of some African change makers. I remember in the early days of Pan-Africanism, the founding fathers of the movement, such as Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Julius Nyerere of T Tanzania, Ahmed Sekouture of Guinea, collaborated with their allies in the Western world, such as Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, Dr. William Edward Burgard Du Bois, better well known as -E W.E.B. Du Bois, and others to fight for our political freedom as a continent. It is time for us to enact the same Pan-African spirit again. This time, it should be directed at tackling the myriads of developmental issues that are facing our resource-rich continent. However, Africa post-colonization has not really fared better than its contemporaries in other climes and continents. Two major reasons that can be attributed to the slow pace at which the continent has been moving are, one, corruption, and two, governance and human rights issues. I will look into five areas where I believe we can collaborate to build a formidable continent. I'll go back to corruption. Corruption in both our public and private establishments have proved to be an albatross to the development of the African continent and individual member states, a situation that is fueled by greed and an inordinate passion 
to acquire more than one needs has led to individuals or organizations engaging in nefarious activities to further their own agenda at the expense of the majority of the people. There are some facts. According to Transparency International, out of 100 most corrupt countries in the whole world, there are 39 countries of African origin. President Ibrahim Buhari of Nigeria also once said, if you don't kill corruption, it will kill you. So how do we collaborate? The AU and other bodies like Transparency International should ensure accountability from heads of governments to entrench anti-corruption practices in their individual countries and sanctions should be meted out on any member or individual found to err. There should not be any sac sacred cows or untouchables. This will send a strong signal that such behavior will no longer be tolerated. Full restitution should be encouraged while trade by barter should be removed. You will find that all over the African continent, once um, culprits have been found out, that they would say to them, okay, what you've stolen, why don't you give us part of it? And then we won't put you, to, put you in jail. Money changes hands and they begin to walk free. I think that should stop. When they err, they should go behind bars. So full restitution should be encouraged. That trade by barter should be completely removed. Civil societies in individual countries must also rise to demand accountability from their government. I'd like to speak about uh, some international collaboration. We cannot prosecute this agenda further if we still have countries and institutions who assist corrupt officials who have stolen public funds to keep these monies in their banks and further their, their economies. There has been a clamor by many African countries for the repatriation of stolen monies by corrupt leaders. I'm using this medium to lend my voice to those requests. We need these monies back so we can move Africa forward. The United Nations should also, as a matter of urgency, compel nations keeping these monies to release them. They should not limit their role to try and corrupt leaders. Though this is applauded, we certainly need our monies back. I believe that most countries will no longer need financial aid if their stolen funds can be repatriated to them to run their economies. We can also have collaboration among civil societies across African nations, working together to present the continent's case on repatriation of funds before the United Nations. Two, governance and human rights abuse. And the facts are, one of the main objectives of the Organization of African Unity, OAU, to rid the continent of the remaining vestiges of colonization and apath apartheid. Two instruments adopted by the OAU to promote human and people's rights in the continent are, one, the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, Nairobi, 1981. Two, the Grand Bay Declaration and Plan of Action on Human Rights. When the primary objective of the OAU was achieved, it was time to speed up economic political integration in the continent. And this paved the way for the birth of the African Union, the AU, which was established on the 9th of September, 1999. The vision of the AU 
is that of an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa, driven by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in global arena. In the year 2000, the Union established the fundamental principles for the promotion of democracy and good governance in the continent. My collaborative suggestions to that are, I commend the African Union for entrenching the demo, uh, democratization process in the Gambia recently. It is imperative that we stand together as a people to ensure that the excesses of heads of governments and human rights abuses are frowned at, are rejected, and maybe even sanctioned. The AU should ensure that there is strict adherence to all the instruments that promote human rights in the continent and any member state or government that flouts this principle should be decisively dealt with without fear or favor. Three, health. Health, as you all know, is wealth. We can only talk of taking giant strides as a continent with our people when our people are strong, when our people are healthy, when our people are vibrant, both in body, spirit, mind, and soul. Many lives are lost daily that are preventable sick, through preventable sicknesses and diseases. What are the facts? According to the report by the Henry J. Kaiser Foundation, Sub-Saharan Africa, is home to nearly 70% of people living with HIV. Cost of access to medical care is high in most African countries in terms of drugs and equipment. Sub-Saharan Africa has the very lowest doctor to patient ratio in the world. Africa just survived the worst Ebola crisis in history. It ravaged six states in West Africa, namely Nigeria, Sudan, Liberia, Guinea, Syria alone, and Mali. It was indeed a great horror, as there were about 28,000 cases and over 11,000 deaths. It is in such circumstances that our connectedness and the grave vulnerabilities that we are exposed to by our neighbors' deficiencies and weaknesses is highlighted. My collaborative suggestions. We can collaborate by sharing knowledge on sickness and treatments that have worked in a region to help a sister country experiencing the same things. Examples are Nigeria, assisted Guinea, Liberia and Syria alone. In the management and treatment of Ebola victims by sending them doctors to those countries. I have no data to predict the number of fatalities that could have resulted if we had not been our brother's keepers. Or had member states not aided the government of those countries most affected. I can only safely state that the outcome would have been far worse and the number of deaths would definitely have been a lot greater. Governments can pull resources together in the research of drugs and inventions that could help the diagnosis, the treatments, and diseases that are common to the continent. My international collaboration suggestions. Collaborative assistance could also come from outside the continent and from non-Africans. Someone may say that this has always been the case and that we are not aliens and it comes to, uh, and if, when it comes to receiving AIDS. However, I'm not talking about financial resources. I'm not talking about just those alone. 
but I'm also talking about ideas and inventions, such as India's Manu Prakash's fold scope and paper fuge. The fold scope is a low cost paper microscope that does the same thing as the conventional microscope that costs less than $1 to build, while the paper fuge is a 20 cent invention that could help in the diagnosis of malaria, HIV, and other diseases around the world. When such breakthrough items become readily available, one can expect that some of today's obstacles and intimidating challenges would have either been better managed or successfully controlled. The desire to find a cost-effective way to deal with malaria is a global good, and Africa should readily embrace such kindness whenever it is uncovered. We have nothing to lose, and we have everything to gain. The Dangote and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation collaboration is a typical example. Four, poor or lack of infrastructure. There are many African countries that suffer for, from poor infrastructure, such as good rail and road networks, access to portable water and networks, on, and power. In fact, most of the infrastructures that are taken for granted in the developed countries are still luxuries in most African countries. So what are the facts? 30 African countries face persistent energy blackouts. Less than 5% of agricultural land is irrigated. Africa's largest infrastructural deficit are found in power and roads. What are my collaboration suggestions? Neighboring countries or regions can come together to build, a, a, to build regional railways to ensure easy and cheaper means of transportation of people, goods, and services across boundaries. Example is uh, the ECOWAS countries can pull together their, their resources to do such things across West Africa. Africa is the continent that has the highest transportation costs. African governments can consider domestic sources of capital through public-private partnerships. Governments and policymakers can also encourage foreign direct investments into their economy by creating conducive environments to attract business owners to invest in building infrastructure and fund such projects that will positively impact the lives of their nationals. This is because Africa does not need aid, but needs partnerships. Collaboration fund between rich African countries to take up the expenses of poor African countries in providing infrastructure to ensure that the common good is pursued. This would be like a once for all investment on the part of the richer African countries to assist the poorer African countries. And there could be, they could say conditions apply. When we put down this investment to assist you so that we can all benefit, then the obligation you, the smaller countries have, or the less buoyant countries have, is to ensure that they maintain what is within their land that has been provided them from, for them through those funds. It is high time African countries change their mindset and move away from protectionism to Africanism and from egoism to allocentrism. Five, education and technology. 
According to a World Bank report on educational quality and national growth of 2007, access to education is one of the highest priorities on the development agenda. Most African countries are ranked among the developing nations of the world today because the educational quality in developing countries is much worse than educational quantity, a picture already quite bleak. Educational quality measured by what people know has powerful effects on individual earnings, on the distribution of income, and on economic growth. So what are the benefits of education on national development? Education raises people's productivity and their creativity and promotes entrepreneurship and technological advancements. It plays a very crucial role in securing economic and social progress and improves income distribution. Education leads to an improvement in the quality of life and leads to broad social benefits to individuals and the society at large. What are my collaboration suggestions for that? In order for Africa to move forward, there is need for African governments to invest in qualitative education at all levels by partnering with private investors to bring about qualitative education. Before I round up, let us take a cursory look at some Africans who have been change makers in their world and in their countries or also across borders. Patrice Motsepe of South Africa, Africa's first black billionaire, launched a new private equity firm focused on investing in Africa. And then there was also Mo Ibrahim of Sudan. Through his foundation, is focused on fighting corrupt leadership in Africa. The foundation also publishes the well-known Ibrahim Index of African Governance, which ranks countries by rule of law, economic opportunity, and human rights. Then there's the Tony Elumelu Foundation, a Nigerian, the initiator of TEEP, who launched a $100 million Pan-African Entrepreneurial Initiative designed to help grow 10,000 startup and young entrepreneurs from across Africa over 10 years. Then there's Dr. Victoria Kisyombe of Tanzania. She's a widow, and she collaborated through Selfina with five other widows to assist women to own lands and assets, especially low-income earners. In Tanzania, it is very, very difficult for women to own lands and assets. And there's Strive Masiewa of Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe's richest man, who set up a $6.4 million trust for sponsoring at least 40 African undergraduates to Morehouse College over a four-year period. His Christian charity sponsors scholarships and medical assistance for over 28,000 orphaned Zimbabweans. Then there's Fred Swanika of Ghana, who co-founded the African Leadership Academy in Johannesburg to develop 6,000 leaders who are going to transform Africa. There's Catherine Inyambura of Kenya. Catherine runs a development program in schools, teaching children about reproductive health, gender equality, and life skills. There's Ashifi Gogo of Ghana, who provides mobile products authentication, MPA, solution to verify the authenticity 
of pharmaceutical products. There's Juliana Rotich of Kenya. Rotich co-founded Ushiadi, an open source software for collecting and mapping inf information. The tool rose to prominence during the violence which erupted in connection with the Kenyan presidential election in 2007. It followed the media to cover the violence more effectively and put pressure on the regime to stop. Then there's Aliko, Alaji Aliko Dangote of Nigeria. The Dangote Foundation is responsible for contributing over $100 million in charitable funds to several causes in Nigeria and Africa over four years. And there's my good self through the Rose of Sharon Foundation, where we focus on the lives of widows, their children, and, or, and orphans through economic empowerment schemes and scholarships to tertiary levels. Also, our Agbami oil field, together with our partners, have given out over 11,000 engineering scholarships to Nigerian students. In conclusion, this conference affords us another opportunity to demonstrate the ingenuity and creativity within us to build the Africa of our dreams. It's about time we throw off the toga of backwardness and underdevelopment and bring forth ideas and workable plans that will give birth to a new Africa, our Africa. One that is no longer defined by poverty, no longer defined by disease, and no longer defined by political instability, but rather by inventions, scientific breakthroughs, and technological advancements that will make us stand equal to other continents of the world. As it has been lightly observed, uh, rightly observed, we tend to overestimate what we can get done in a year. But we equally underestimate what we can get done in a decade. Yes, predicting the future can be daunting. It is never an exact science nor can we plot development on a linear time scale. Yet, so much can be done to engender the types of solutions that we crave. Why am I so positive about Africa's transformation? It's because I believe very strongly in my heart that it is achievable, that we can. Throughout history, it has always been the case that solutions have often been birthed by simulated turmoil, some sort of controlled anarchy or organized chaos, bringing on some new sets of eyes to look at an old problem. No idea should be rejected at first. Every idea must have its day in court. It should be given a chance to vent its merits and flaunt its capabilities, especially this weekend. I welcome everyone to this historic event. And I say, let the collaborations begin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Madam Alakija, and thank you so much for highlighting the five challenges, but also putting forward the solutions as well as how we can collaborate on those solutions. So again, please help, please put your hands together for Mrs. Alakija. And now this is the fun part. We get to ask her some questions. There are four uh, mics, um, one at uh, the top, to my top right, 
uh, top left and then one at the, um, at the bottom. Please um, ask your questions and uh, the few uh, rules that I have is kindly introduce yourself, t uh, tell us who you are, please keep your remarks, questions are very short, our time is short, and make sure that the question does have a question mark at the end. Thank you so much and I look forward to the Q&A session. Thank you. No, go ahead. Thank you very much. Powerful speech. I mean, I was really inspired by your speech. Uh, my name is Joe Wilson. I come from Liberia, and I'm a student at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. Well, I was interested in your speech, the part you mentioned about corruption. I mean, obviously, Liberia is one of the victims of corruption. But since you come from a very strong religious background, I want to direct my focus of fighting corruption from the religious standpoint. Because most of African governments are really influenced by religion, either the Muslim or Christian or traditional African practices. So my question is, given the fact that corruption is really killing Africa, killing a lot of people, stopping progress and development, but most of the government officials do come from some sort of religious background. For example, some corrupt government officials do come from churches and mosques. Is it not time that churches and mosques must begin to take the lead in shunning and shaming those people who are corrupting public offices? Absolutely. I agree with you. It's about time. Um, it's not that these things aren't preached in the churches. It's not that they're not preached in the, in the mosques and wherever they worship. But they choose. They, I mean, they choose to, to hear it, let it go through here and come out of here because of the greed. It's greed. Those who want to pocket money through egoism, um, self-centeredness, and wanting their way, their way of governance has nothing to do with the way God wants them to run the governments. God's ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. But people make their own choices. He has given them the opportunity to make their choices. Though he has spelt out what his ways are in those guidelines in the Bible and in the Quran, but they have the opportunity to make their choices. It's unfortunate that the corrupt ones make their choice of going the wrong way. And that does not mean that everyone is corrupt. But you hear about the corruption through a few bad eggs, and that pollutes the entire country and the entire continent, unfortunately. Thank you. Uh, up there, please. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Esiosa Kemia Kenzwa. Um, I'm a freshman at Harvard College, and I wanted to ask uh, how best you think uh, children of the diaspora, like me, my parents are Nigerian immigrants, can best contribute to um, changing the narrative of Africa, as you spoke about, as a place of, of, of corruption and poverty, and change it into the narrative of a place of development, not just of the future, but of today, and how we can best contribute to that um, after we complete our studies. What's the question? Oh, sorry. Just how best uh, you think uh, students like me who um, grew up in America but whose uh, parents are uh, immigrants from Africa can best uh, change the narrative of Africa in America and in our own schools and return and help. The, yeah. yeah. How, how can, um, how can uh, the, the diaspora help to change the narrative uh, on, on Africa? Well, I believe that um, you are a new generation. What you should do is not to look at the neg negative um, uh, aspects of the continent, but to be determined to bring about change to the continent and not to continue to remain in other parts of the world, but come back to Africa to make that change. Uh, because it is in togetherness that we can make things happen and begin to talk to our people as younger generation to bring in fresh, fresh and new blood 
into the system so that you can begin to see the, the, the difference, even in their lifetime, in our lifetime, that because of what you have learned whilst you were abroad, you can bring those to bear on the continent. And when they can see how you can make a difference, they'll begin to learn even from you in their lifetime, and change can begin to happen. Thank you. Please keep your uh, questions short um, over here. Good afternoon, Mrs. Alakija. My name is Toyosi Akirele. I come from Nigeria. I'm currently a student at the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government, taking a master in public administration. I've got two very quick questions. Number one, Africa has got 54 countries. Half of those countries have the oldest leaders in the world. Um, Africa is a continent in the world with the oldest leaders. And by that, I mean leaders 70 years and above. Um, the leather that is used to produce Louis Vuitton, Fendi, uh, Ralph Lauren, and most of the top designers in the world are made in a tannery in Kano, Nigeria. Um, the doctor who wrote the story, who discovered um, the story that made the movie Concussion by Will Smith is a Nigerian. Mpesa, the mobile money uh, intervention in Kenya is the world's leading mobile money solution. Africa's problem is not in the people. It's not in our capacity to think. It's not even in our ability to innovate. Africa's problem is the leaders in our governments. Um, and my question to you, because I know that you have a level of proximity to the people in the government, is um, I'm worried about the fact that the young people, even here at Harvard, the, the black woman, the first black woman to ever become the president of the Harvard Law Review is a Nigerian young woman. So Africa has no problem being on the world map with creating anything and leading the world. But our government are the pain in our necks. So I wanted to ask you, ma'am, number one, what does Africa need to do to ensure that the old people can step aside so that young people can take responsibility? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and, I, and I say this to you because, so Mark Zuckerberg, his biggest, first and biggest investment of $24 million is in Lagos, Nigeria, Africa. And so we have no business being where we are at the moment. A continent without infrastructure, no electricity, no water, no roads. Our children don't speak English. And we have Forbes millionaires. A few of them like you, good people like you, doing very great work. Rwanda has the highest gender equality in the world. With a woman earning 88 cents to a man's dollar, Rwanda also has a second gender equality gap in the world as well. What do we do about this continent where old men are already taking our future from us? We have no problem with the young people. We, wanna, we are ready to lead. We don't want to follow uh, politicians who don't think about the next generation but are fixated on the next election. Thank I thank you. you. When you finish from Harvard, I'm waiting for you in Nigeria to come and make a difference. We need people like you. You need to be the voices for the, for, for, for the ones that are not talking or not doing anything. They will. You just need to come back. Have to do that first. Absolutely. You know that. I, listen, I don't go back on my words. You know that. <laughs> now, the only way that you can get them to step aside is by proving yourself that we are able. We are here. We are ready. We can. It's just the same way I answered the other lady. You can't get them to step back if you don't provide, provide something that will replace them. If you are at a distance and you've got your arms folded and you're doing sit down look, <laughs> we're not going to get anywhere. Yes, Nigerians are highly intelligent people and we are all over the world. And there are many who are in Nigeria who feel helpless. Yes, I agree with you because of some of the leaders that are doing all these negative things. I'll just call them negative things. 
But, you know, one person can make a difference in the midst of millions of people. We know the story of those that we've read about in history. Who decided to rise up to the occasion of whatever it was that they were feeling for their, for their nation and for their people. And others would follow. We're not, we won't all be leaders. But the leaders amongst us should take their rightful positions and the rest will follow. And things will begin to happen. We need more of people like you. I know you. I know you very well. <laughs> so God will help us. But we have to also help ourselves. Uh, thank you for the very down-to-earth lecture. I'm Jacob Olukwona, a professor of African and African-American studies and religion at uh, Harvard uh, University. Thanks for the um, inspirational book you gave me last time you came. I, I read it and I enjoyed it. The question asked by the first person about religion is very fundamental. But my take on that, and I'd like to comment, is that it has to do with a value system, which is the fact that we have neglected indigenous value system. I'm not talking about indigenous religion. And part of the problem has been caused by Islam and Christianity. I was born by a priest myself. I'm an Anglican like you, and I understand that. To the extent that some, uh, recently somebody asked that we should ask the Nigerian senators to take the oath of office with the iron, the symbol of Ogun. They swear with the Koran and the Bible, knowing that this God delays judgment till Algena, till the other world. But for the, those in the indigenous value system, it is here and now. So there's an attempt to jettison what has been good for our parents. Not necessarily the so-called pagan tradition, but the basic value. And any nation, any country, any continent that decides to throw away his own, the sources of his own worldview and tradition will continue to be slaves to others forever. Madam, is it possible for us to go back to this without necessarily asking people to go to indigenous religion? This is my plea. The values of our forefathers were entrenched in Africans right from centuries ago. However, we find that the world is changing. And people are throwing away those values. They're ignoring them. They were taught not to lie. They were taught not to cheat. They were not taught not to steal. Those are some of the very tenements of every African family. But a lot has been happening within the world. I'm not saying that it's an excuse, far from it, far be it. But people are bowing down to the pressures of the world and bowing down to Satan as he dangles his temptations. Because it's easy to fall for it, they fall for it. And they ignore the past. They even ignore what they were brought up to do and to say and, to, and how to behave. Because back again to greed. It's greed. They're all busy chasing money. And they forget where they're coming from. It's unfortunate. But that is the reason why we are talking of collaboration. I couldn't talk on every point within my 25 or 30 minutes. 
We can carry on and we will not leave here. And that's why we are here for this weekend. <laughs> why we are asking all of you to prefer solutions. As to how we can collaborate. And begin to drum it in the ears of the new generation, the younger generation, the upcoming generation. And begin to instill those values that we learned back into our children that we're having now. We mustn't be too busy not to teach our children. Charity begins at home. We have to be focused. We have to go back to basics. And I always say the same, the, the, the same thing, even with marriages. Why are marriages breaking up all over the world? Mm. It's for the same reason. That people aren't going back to basics. The basics of things that our forefathers taught our parents and our grandparents that this is the way to behave in matrimony. Now, the young ones just want to do their own thing. They get married today, a month later, they've taken off the ring. So it's the same thing that's happening. We need to go back to those values. We had them. And unfortunately, we let them slip through our fingers. But you know what? It's not the end of the world. When we realize our mistakes, and we're ready and we're willing to go back to make amendments, to find solutions, which is one of the reasons why we're gathered here, we will talk to one another. We'll encourage one another. We'll prefer solutions. And we will form partnerships and anything and everything to be able to come together to make a difference. And that is why I reminded us of that African proverb when I was starting out. Mm. Thank you. Keep your questions very short. We are very short on time, and I may have to cut some of the questions. Of course. Please go ahead. Good evening, madam. Um, my name is over here. My name is Abimbala Aditunji. I'm a graduate student at the Harvard School of Education. And you spoke about education and access, but not just access, but quality and public private partnerships. So, my question to you was if you could give a five step solution to how young people can partner with governments in the face of bureaucracy and corruption, what would those five steps be? Five. If you could give a five-step solution to how young people can partner with governments in the face of bureaucracy and corruption, what would those five steps be? So in the interest of time, I'll just ask you to give one step. OK. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> because I just don't have time. I mean, it's fine. I understand. Honor the others. Just one step to how students can collaborate Wait. with we thank God that um, you're already um, on the right track. You've come to Harvard to learn more about education. I should be asking you that question. What have you learned? <laughs> what are you bringing back to help our governments in our continent to make a difference in the educational sector? So I'm bringing back the knowledge, like you said. But my question then is, when, you, when I think of like my experience, I'm Nigerian, and I think of the experience with trying to partner with local governments, for example, and someone tells you you need to bring 50,000 naira if you want to do good in a school, for example. And I know that you've had to deal with the government before, and you were successful without tainting your image. And so that's sort of why I asked you, what would you see are the steps, or how can you do that without being entrenched in the bureaucracy and corruption? But in the interest of time. You, you do not have to fall for any gimmicks. You don't have to fall for uh, people who dangle carrots uh, before you. You can always walk out of a situation like that. You reject having anything to do with such a person. As I said, it's a few bad eggs that would taint a, a group, a region, community, and a country, and a continent. It's not everyone that's bad. Go on to the next local government, but don't give up. There'll always be the one that will listen to you 
especially if you can demonstrate what you can do by giving examples and um, making sure that the example you're giving, you're not just doing it verbally, you are actually demonstrating it. Okay. That way, nobody can say, <laughs> what you're saying is wrong. We don't believe you. Uh, you can't do this. You've already proved it. So when you go from one local government to another, I'm sure that you will be able to get an inroad to at least one. And once you make an inroad to one, you can use that and replicate it with the other local governments. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. One last question, please. My name is Nirali Patel. I'm an urban planning student at the Graduate School of Design. Um, so as a key figure in Africa's oil industry, how do you encourage and how do you see your own role in the shift from, uh, the very necessary shift from oil into a clean, in a clean energy industry? I uh, give talks from time to time. Um, yes, the topic is not anything to do with oil today, but um, I thank God that I do get those speaking engagements where I'm being asked to talk about this or that. And uh, in some of those engagements, it, it has to do with the oil industry, and sometimes I go as far as Singapore. I, I remember going to Singapore twice in one month. Um, and uh, one was about uh, women in business, encouraging the public, not just uh, um, the people that were in the audience. We thank God for, for the internet. And uh, the other was on the oil industry. So um, we need to encourage those who are coming you know, behind us. Uh, we need to set good examples and be good role models. And, uh, and then the question is shift from oil industry to clean energy. To clean energy. Mm -hmm. Shifting from oil to clean energy. Um, it's, is, it is uh, extremely expensive. But I know that with time, uh, the costs are going to come down. Um, and that is the reason why it hasn't been popular yet. Um, there need to be partnerships, of course, collaborations uh, to make that happen. Uh, clean e energy is, of course, the safest, the best, but it's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Madame Lakija for your remarks and for uh, conducting the Q&A and for your insights. Uh, into um, just business uh, and, uh, and the continent of Africa. Please put your hands together for Madame Alakija.